What's up, PySwim users? I'm so excited to share perhaps the newest and most exciting video in our tutorial series, writing control logic using pure PySwim. In this lesson, I'll step you through the various steps in how to implement control logic in Python to connect to your model, and I'll also talk through some of the most important pitfalls and limitations of how this works. So let's dive straight in. Let's go to www.pyswim.org, and let's move over here to the examples and we're going to scroll down and we're going to go to the espresso machine controls example download the uh, bundle here i've already done that so i won't do it again so when you navigate when you unzip it and you check check out what's in there we start out with the regular input file model we have a pdf with a bunch of information that's super helpful including the pitfalls that i'll be talking about today as well as just a description of what you can do with the various types of links in Swim and how you can control them. The next thing we have is our example Python code. In this case, it's going to run a before and after case for a simulation with and without control. And then lastly, what I'll show you here is the example network that we're going to play with. This is a toy model, very trivial controls example. We've got three branches that essentially descend down to uh, an interceptor system here. Uh, there are orifice control to enter the interceptor, and if you shut the control, then there's a storage tank upstream at all these different nodes of storage tanks. And if you surcharge the storage tank enough, you actually have a sewer overflow, combined sewer overflow. Um, in this case, if you leave the orifices all the way open, either junction one or junction two in this example is intentionally designed to flood. So we have a, a multi-objective problem here. We're trying to reduce the flooding in the interceptor system as well as the total overflow volume. Um, this is just a very simple profile view of what a regulator looks like in this case. So we have a bit of an understanding of the network. Let's take a look at a simple controls problem. I've written out what we call a state machine. A state machine is basically a model, a situation. It will remain in a certain state until a condition to exit a state is met. Um, in this case, we've got, we're building a, a really, really simple controller. It's not that exciting, but the point is to convey how to write controls. We have three states. We have a dry weather state, a wet weather state, and a dewatering state. Interestingly, if you do look pretty close at this state machine, you might find that there's a couple exit conditions that should be considered. But again, it's a basic trivial controls problem. Okay, so now we're going to actually take a look at what's happening in the code. Uh, I've got the full example to the right, and then we're going to copy paste different contents into the, into the Python script to the left here. And so what I'm going to do is grab, what we're doing is we're running the first model simulation without control. So that's actually the case where we have flooding in the interceptor. And then we're going to run it a second time, but with control. And so I'm going to grab all of this Python code, copy it over, make sure it runs, and then we'll talk about it. So we'll put it over here, save it. And then I'm going to go to my environment here. Or my, yeah, okay. And running with and without, or without and with control. Okay, so everything ran, but let's talk about what's happening here. In this case, you know, as I said before, there's no control, but we are just doing our normal like appending array, so we, for plotting purposes. And then here we're actually doing some post processing after the simulation. Remember when it steps out of this tabbed in region, that means the simulation has ended and giving you access still to the results if you if it tabs back down one more time that actually closes the model uh, so this is just for some post-processing building a table i'll show that in just a minute here um, with the case of writing simple control using this this uh, state machine that we have i'll pop that up too we, we are instantiating more links so that we can actually apply the control and we're getting instantiating more nodes and storage and from just so we can start whether it's tracking information or tracking depths that we can we just have all the information for our simulation we are using step advance this is where it starts to come in really handy step advance reduces the interaction frequency between python and c when swim is written in c so 
this allows the engine itself to step forward approximately 300 seconds plus a routing time step. And uh, when it, it will then release control back to high swim. So we're doing the same thing we did before. We're appending time series data just so we can plot it. Again, a hor horribly inefficient way to do it. We're using a variable here to track the state. And we're also, we're gonna st I'll start talking through this in a second. Um, so initially our start state is dry weather state. So in wet weather variable equals false means we're in dry weather. So as we enter our simulation, line 75 is where our simulation loop starts. We are actually starting the iterator. And every time we iterate forward, the simulation advances. So the first thing we do is we check this conditional. If J2 depth is greater than four and a half feet and wet weather in wet weather equals false, then we would start, we would dive into this block. In that case here on the right, we would go from dry weather state into wet weather state. What happens when, that, when we do that? So the orifice one target setting setter is then used. And so what we're saying is we're going to set this orifice only open to 15%, 0.15. And so this gives us an opportunity to talk about this table at the beginning of the PDF. For various link types, there are setting ranges of interest that are really useful to know. For a weir, you can only open it between zero and one, so 100% closed or 100% open. Uh, for an orifice, same, it's the same. You have between zero and one for the fractional setting and it's 0%, 100% open. Interestingly enough, this sets the target setting. So if you're using your time to actuate feature in swim, then uh, it's still considered, it still allows it to go through its actuation time process. For a pump, this is where it gets super interesting. Um, definitely take a minute to read this paragraph, uh, but the benefit of a, the thing to think about with a pump is anytime you use a target setting, it's almost always used as like a scaling factor. So technically, your setting range can go from zero to infinity. Therefore, if you have a, your, your pump curve may resolve that your flow rate going through the pump is 50 liters per second. If you apply a target setting of 0.5, that'll result in 25 liters per second. Um, fun facts, this is a, a really cool case if you use a type four pump. It actually works for others, but a pump for, uh, type four pump is the most, it's the easiest to understand. And you give it your X range of between basically zero to a thousand, and then you, you give it a constant one. What you can do then is you can say target setting of zero to shut it off, or you can say target setting of 100 to throw 100 liters per second through the pump. Now, uh, in this case, we, we are considerate. If, if there's not 100 liters per second incoming to the upstream node, then it'll be throttled to whatever's coming into that upstream node. Um, so there's just a lot of cool things you can do with this, but your, your pumps can go between zero and infinity. So back down here, uh, once we enter our, once we have jumped to our wet weather state here, notice we're using else if conditionals. So that means that once it's entered one of these states, it's actually going to skip all the way down past all these other states and then re-enter here. And now it's in, we've set wet weather to true. So now there's only these other conditions that are applicable. Um, so again, there are a couple exit cases that are not considered here, but again, it's a simple example just to demonstrate. So let's go ahead and start looking at the results out of this. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and grab the kind of in that plotting content. That is kind of interesting. So I'm making, the first thing I'm doing is making a little table. It's really nice to have this when you're kind of doing mass balance checks. So I'll save that, run that again. Why don't we check to see what it looks like? So we've got the models. Okay, we made a little table. And this is just to kind of, you know, validate the behavior of the model to make sure that 
you know, we in this model, we're actually using hard-coded time series inflows up within those those three branches, it's just to make sure everything's working out. And uh, what came out of the model with the flooding, the difference between the before and after case, as well as the CSOs, you know, how much is activated in them. And in this case, we eliminated the flooding and we didn't get any CSOs. So we this is an optimized network, probably. And the last thing I'll do just for fun is I'll go ahead and make the same plot that we have in the figure. And then there's a bonus um, using swim IO that we can actually make a nice profile plot, which I think is pretty nice. It's pretty useful. So we've got our flooding PNG here. We just made recreated this figure. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pip install swim IO. Okay, Swim.io has been installed, and then what I'll do is I'll grab this bonus profile plot. Um, I can't guarantee that this feature is going to stay as is in Swim.io. We may be moving this to a different library, but for now, at least in this example, it should work. So let's go ahead and run this one more time. Okay, and so now you've got, this is your interceptor plot here. This is, you know, these are your various, the three branches, and it shows the hydraulic grade line in each part of the network. And so we've eliminated the flooding with adding some control. Uh, one of the most important pitfalls to talk about, they're both written really well here, but I think they're worth discussing. If you intend to control an asset using PySwim, if you have control rules inside your swim model, you need to comment them out or remove them for controlling asset XYZ. If you're trying to control an asset and using step advance, during the times that PySwim has control, that will take priority and set the control action during the times that if when you're using step advance and the simulation is in charge and swim is in charge of of you know advancing forward and there's control logic those con those controls will take priority and so um, the other thing that's really important to do is when you're migrating control logic from swim to pi swim it's really good practice to just set the pump status to always on, and then you can actually shut the pumping flow off using the target setting. That's just a really good thing because there's some some odd edge cases uh, that that we found before that kind of make it really complicated to debug. But you know, some of the main benefits to using Pi Swim in uh, in your workflow is it's so much easier to debug your control logic. So much easier, and it just really optimizes everything you're trying to do. Uh, when you're doing sophisticated control development inside of SWIM, it is, it is very cumbersome to understand what's going on if you're using widgets, if you're using timers, and all that stuff. It just, it's been, it's been a really, really convenient thing to have PySwim around. So thank you so much for watching.